so uh, I will introduce myself. I'm uh, Jack Chiu. I'm from uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, but at the same time, I wear another activist hat. So I see myself as a scholar activist. I'm a board member for SAM. Okay, it's a major uh, labor NGO in Hong Kong that works on uh, labor issues uh, in the electronics and the garment industries of mainland China. Okay, so SACOM, S-A-C-O-M, stands for Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior. When you came in on the table, you see those are the SACOM publications, and uh, even there's an iSlave placard. So if so there's an active uh, iSlave campaign now, so you can, you can hold that placard to take a picture and put the uh, the, the pound, you know, the, the Twitter handle and put it online, and it's a global campaign. We're, we're doing because uh, I, I just learned from Luke, okay, today that Apple is going to release its next iPhone in six days. Right? So, so, okay, so, so, so uh, it's, uh, it's something uh, people thinking critically, okay, we uh, are also doing things in Hong Kong and in different parts of the world, okay, about this technology as a, as a, as a group. Okay, so, uh, so that's who I am, and uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Dave to put uh, today's events together. I want to thank the colleagues, comrades at the Feminist Library, okay, and uh, everyone for, for, for coming. Uh, so, I uh, so this is uh, about my book, which came out last uh, November. I will use about 25 minutes to give a very schematic uh, discussion about what uh, what slavery is in the 21st century, which I will apply okay, this schematic uh, you know, framework to define slavery in the contemporary age okay, to, the, to conditions of digital capitalism uh, from the assembly line to the data line, okay, which is, so I'll give a, 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 a brief okay, introduction about this uh, book. And of course, the goal is to sell more books. Right? Uh, every uh, uh, every uh, pound I earned from this book uh, is donated to a, a labor NGO in the Congo, okay, Eastern Congo, in the Kivu provinces. So that we, just now, Nina already talked about the extraction. The, the African World War sometimes is also called because of this conflict mineral. So your your purchase of the book you know, uh, will not end up in my personal account, it will end up in Congo, you know, helping to eliminate the conflict minerals. So uh, I will use a chunk of my uh, uh, sharing will be about manufacturing slave, <coughs> such as workers at Foxconn, the world's largest electronics manufacturer, known for its notorious sweatshop conditions, comparable, arguably, to the transatlantic triangular trade. I will mention very briefly a second mode of slavery, such as Facebook free labor, although I won't go into detail today, uh, so as to save more time and discuss uh, anti-slavery struggles and openings for digital abolition through collective resistance, creative means, and WGC worker-generated content, above and beyond the colonial logic of individualistic and desocialized UGC, i.e. user-generated content. But first, let me confess, I was an ice slave probably before many people in this room. In the 80s, as a young teenager, I was addicted to an Apple II game on the left, it's called Load Runner. Okay, I was addicted when I was 14 years old right, to Apple products. In the 90s, when I was a Peking University student, I wore an Apple pin, so you see that in the middle, on the outside of my sweater for an entire winter. I was proud. Okay, I was using Apple okay, 20 years ago. 10 years ago, when my wife gave me an eye touch as a birthday gift, I was happy like a baby. I was indeed and complacent, as complacent in what I'm about to critique as most iGadget users. <laughs> Frankly speaking, for me, arriving at this book today is completely unexpected journey. Yet, I'm here 
now presenting this unlikely idea because I am trained a social scientist and I see great utility in connecting slavery with things digital. In this new book, I see slavery as much more than a past condition or a provocative metaphor for contemporary reality. It is more precisely a comparative method that rehistoricizes our thinking about digital media and labor. This is crucial because I happen to possess too many scattered empirical observations, some collected by myself, much more by the 20 University Research Network led by Professor Hun Nai, my colleague at the University of Hong Kong. And uh, all these observations are about Foxconn and the global digital media industry, for which I need a much more coherent analytical framework. Because studies of Chinese media have suffered increasingly from methodological exceptionalism, or sometimes we call them Chinese okay, uh, exceptionalism, yet with the comparative slavery framework, we can reconnect China with world history reconnect transatlantic and trans-Pacific struggles as one continuous long durée process. This conceptual enlargement can be a conceptual breakthrough. This is how I borrow from history, sociology, and legal studies to define slavery. First, there are two deep foundations for enslavement. One is Eurocentric capitalist modernity. The other, the capacity of slave regimes to mutate over time. Slavery is surprisingly resilient. It transforms as capitalism takes on new forms. Standing on the quicksand of capitalist modernity, the immediate and tangible foundation for slavery is geopolitics, by which I mean the political, economic, and <coughs> military complex of empire building, ocean, you know, expanding oceans and continents into the new world of cyberspace. Sometimes today we call it uh, America, China America, or YouTube, okay? That's uh, one of the new ways to call this new uh, political uh, uh, economy or em new empire structure. Slavery has two pillars, alienation, or more precisely, NATO alienation, as Orlando Patterson puts it, is one. The other is resistance by the enslaved, whose revolutionary spirits inspire us in reimagining a better digital economy, a more humane world. The ultimate goal of slavery is to exploit the enslaved under conditions of abnormal labor capital relationship. In order to reach this goal, surplus value from alienated labor has to be extracted from processes of consumption dominated by hegemonic cultures of consumerism, now coded in corporate algorithms, the latest instrument of enslavement through social media. Finally, borrowing from legal scholarship, especially from the 2012 Bellagio Harvard guidelines on the legal parameters of slavery, I define I slavery as de facto conditions in, instead of de jure status. If any uh, power attached to ownership is found to exist, such as possession, transfer, or disposal, then it suffices as institutions or practices similar to slavery, to use the strict uh, legal uh, language. You know, this is in the international okay, uh, uh, anti-slavery uh, legislation. Uh, this is the thesis of my book. Digital capitalism revives slavery, but it also spurs new anti-slavery movements that hold the premise of emancipation. Developing this thesis, we possess a conceptual lens that opens new vistas and brings in fresh thinking. It enables us to travel back and forth between the 17th and the 21st centuries. You may therefore enjoy this small book not only as another volume to read, but also as a time machine that enables time traveling, so to speak. More specifically, this is how I summarize my conceptual analysis as three models of trans triangular exchange. 
On the left is 17th century transatlantic triangular trade among Europe, West Africa, and the New World of the Western Hemisphere. This is a classic formation of colonialism and historical capitalism based on the flow of African slaves, sugar, and money. At the bottom is 21st century eye slavery. Here, Apple is singled out due to its close affinity with Foxconn. Yet, it's not just Apple, but also other major gadget brands as well. Structurally speaking, the Apple-Foxconn relationship is comparable to the Europe-West Africa exchange four centuries ago. Together, they expand to the new world of digital consumption and social media, where UGC <coughs> is the new sugar, so to speak. On the right is a new model of anti-slavery exchange, where organized network labor functions as the third pillar of network society, forming dialectic relationship with network enterprise, the big corporations, and network states, the EU, WTO, Chin America. The cultural capital and social innovation of network labor materializes through working class ICTs, which are used to create collective and activism-oriented WGC, worker-generated content. WGC converge in working class public spheres that leads to DNA, digitally networked action, which produces new meaning and new praxis for network labor, thereby facilitating a new model of global anti-slavery circuits. Excuse me, Jack. When you say working class ICTs, what's ICT there? Uh, information and communication technology. Okay. Right. I have a so that's that technology being used by working class. Uh, 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 yes, Sim simply it says that. I have an earlier book uh, uh, from 2009 called Working Class Network Society. Okay, you can you can uh, have a more uh, fuller definition, you know, uh, in, in, in that book. Right. And uh, while we're while we're dealing with uh, acronyms, UGC is user user generated content. I.e., the stuff that we post on Facebook. Uh, yeah. Right. So, um, all right. So this uh, book is critique of digital media slavery is fleshed out in two chapters. One is on the manufacturing I slave, also known as <coughs> I slavery in the production mode. The other is on uh, is uh, manufactured the I slave or I slavery in the consumption mode. I won't detail all the analysis here, but in the manufacturing domain, the story starts in the bowels of the earth, in the DRC, in the Congo, that Nina just uh, talked about, the extraction industry, where the so-called blood minerals are extracted by miners, including child labor, who are under warlord's control. These minerals are essential to the electronic components in our smartphones. The components are then assembled in factories such as Foxconn. This is how uh, Foxconn. Oh, okay, there should be another uh, another picture before this, all right? But but essentially, this is how uh, on the right you see this is how Foxconn looks like from inside ten years ago, right? There could be up to three hundred workers sleeping on three-level bunk beds in one huge room without air conditioning. This is in southern China tropical area. Okay? According to a worker who lived in this dormitory, quote, the order of sweat and dirty feet was suffocating, end quote. This reminds us of the lower deck of the slave ship in the middle passage. On the left you see here is uh, how things look like for the slave trade during the middle passage with African bodies being packed together, suffocated in the packed space with extremely poor ventilation. Another parallel is the transfer of laboring bodies who are all free and cannot escape. The auction of African or African-American slaves is on the left. On the right, you would see student interns, quote-unquote interns, sent by vocational schools in the Chinese hinterland to Foxconn on the Chinese coast. These are usually youngsters in their late teens, 
without working in Foxconn for three months, they simply could not graduate. At school, they majored in accounting, English, pharmaceutics. But at Foxconn, they are all assigned to the most tedious of assembly line work, making iPhone back cases, for instance. As their line managers told me in my interviews, each day, they had to stand for 10 hours while making iPhone cases. In the first week, all girls would break down in tears. In the second week, all boys would cry due to the excruciating pain in their legs. If you have been standing there 10 hours a day, seven days a week, you will know what, what pain is. Yet, they could not really leave because otherwise, they won't be able to re receive their graduation diplomas. Uh, both the schools and the factory of Foxconn benefit handsomely from this transfer of enslaved bodies. In our latest uh, iSlave campaign, you know, I, we actually made a video. Okay, if you go to Sarcom uh, YouTube channel, you can see a video, you know, uh, two months from two months ago about student interns. Okay, in, in making making our iPhones and Samsungs. Uh, what happens if a worker gets sick? Okay, due to vocational disease, like leukemia. What about cases of work injury when the employees could not work any longer? Will the factory take care of them, as required by Chinese labor law? No. This book contains several sad stories of workers being disposed of, which in essence is not too different from the discarding of African bodies when they became liabilities during the Atlantic trade. The most horrifying tragedies took place in 2010 when 15 Foxconn workers jumped from tall buildings within six months. Never before had such a theory of suicides been recorded in the history of industrial capitalism. So industrial capitalism has not, long, not, not only continued globally, it has deteriorated. If we talk about 70s you know, or you know, 60s industrial capitalism in the UK. However, uh, if we go back to the transatlantic uh, trade, we could find a surprisingly similar device of labor discipline and social control against the attempt of enslaved populations uh, from taking their own lives. And that was called the anti jumping nets. According to According to Olaudach Aquiano, the slave boy who survived the Middle Passage, okay, Aquiano is probably one of the most famous slaves okay, who were emancipated and wrote about his experience during the, the Middle Passage. You know, uh, uh, um, uh, Aquiano witnessed the jumping of his fellow Africans <coughs> through the nettings because they wished to die and free themselves from the miseries of enslavement during the tri triangular Atlantic trade. At the time, anti-jumping nets were a, a standard equipment for slave ships. These nets became obsolete since the abolition of transatlantic trade in the 19th century. But in 2010, they reappear after more than a, a century and a half. They reappear on top of Foxconn buildings as depicted on the right. This is the place where Foxconn workers, okay, they sleep after they make our eye devices. So this, uh, this 21st century anti-jumping nets consists of three levels. On the very top, sky net. At the bottom of the building, ground net. All windows and corridors are sealed with the middle net. Foxconn claimed to have taken down these anti-jumping nets and China's media censorship means we do not have a full account of suicide in Foxconn since 2010. But the suicide have continued. Last year in Zhengzhou, Henan province in central China, where most of the latest iPhones are made, we still have reliable sources about a worker leaping to death after uh, assembling iPhone 7s. To wrap up this part, there are many parallels between electronics, sweatshops of 21st century, and 17th century slavery of the Atlantic system, seen through a global and long-duration perspective. 
The culprit is not a single company or a single country. It is rather APCON, A-P-P-C-O-N-N. -N. This is a new term I coined in this book. This is a new uh, world system for not only gadgets manufacturing, but also NATO alienation and enslavement, transfer of unfree bodies, disposal of quote-unquote useless labor, and the anti-jumping nets. The next chapter is about manufactured or consumption mode as ice slavery, which contains several arguments about digital labor, voluntary servitude, time uh, serving as a hidden dimension of exploitation, as well as feminist critique. It starts with the real case of a Chinese teenager from a working class family in Anhui who sold one of his kidneys to buy an iPhone and an iPad in 2011. I won't be able to summarize the complex argument in this short presentation, but the basic historical comparison is with the addictive substances of the Atlantic system centuries ago, including tobacco and alcohol. Also, the real driving force for 17th century transatlantic trade was sugar. Today, we have the functional equivalents in digital media. Facebook, WeChat is the Chinese equivalent of Facebook, and Candy Crush, etc. Right? This is the uh, crucial revelation. Historically, increase of slave production in the new world has to be accompanied by the rise of consumption in the old. Hegemonic consumerist culture is key to the domination of APCOM when system-generated consumption markets serve as a pillar of the new world system that is indispensable, uh, that is as in indispensable as production apparatus. Today's addictive substance come from the games, social media platforms, as much as, much as it, had, it was for those who are addicted to sugar, alcohol, and tobacco. We lost our freedom and become slaves when we, become, when we are addicted. However, with the darkening of sky, we see, the bright, we see brighter stars of hope. This is the focus of my last substantive and the longest chapter. I slavery is not the end of the world. It is rather a fresh start for the constant struggle of human species toward liberty. Liberty for all working people and their families who now has, have their own digital device. Among historians, there are two strands of thought about anti-slavery. One emphasizes abolition by the elite, the educated, the middle class, lawyers, religious people. Maybe most people in this room, myself included. And abolition is done from the top down. The other is to see through the eyes of the oppressed, African and Afro-Americans, the indigenous people, the women, the illiterate, the black Jacobins who resist the powers that be at the grassroots level and from the bottom up. While I am an abolitionist, my work leans more towards the second strand that, that, that stresses the resistance of the enslaved. There are three insights from the historical literature that throw light on my analysis. First, anti-slavery takes many forms, singing and dancing, stealing, sabotage, hunger strike, suicide, the list goes on. Second, slavery and anti-slavery, accommodation and resistance coexist in global and regional context. Third, bloody confrontation are exceptional. More common forms of resistance was in culture, in everyday work and life. There are three phases I would uh, outline in this chapter about working class social media in China. Okay, so working class ICTs, okay, which has a longer history even before 2004. But starting from 2004, we have three stages of uh, work, uh, working class social media, starting from QQ, the most popular instant messenger. Okay, still today, when Chinese workers have strikes, they mostly communicate through QQ. Right? And later on, there's a stage when weblog and online video, including podcasts, became more popular. And then the latest is Weibo and WeChat. Okay, so this is more like Twitter and, and, and Facebook. 
So there's a, a Chinese development, you know, in, in already in three phases. And these are all videos taken by Foxconn workers. So they are uh, uh, working, uh, work, worker-generated content, talking about their collective uh, struggles, right, in different formats. And uh, you can read about these videos in, in the book. And the, so the um, impressive as all these Chinese okay, developments are, I would argue in this book, these acts of working class social media on the picket line in China are still less remarkable, comparable to the revolutionary Atlantic. Right? This uh, is uh, Shakespeare's last play. It was actually inspired by okay, the, uh, one of the very important transatlantic struggle in Bermuda. Right? The, and that's the origin of the Tempest, which you can read about in the Magic Hydra, okay, in that book, about the revolutionary Atlantic. And if you look at, this is something closer to home, okay, most of these art collections, abolitionist uh, uh, you know, collections are actually in museums in London, right? So the the uh, abolitionist uh, society, and this, these are what I would call the the memes, all right? Uh, not digital media memes, but okay, porcelain, gold pin, okay, industrial era, okay, memes when upper class, okay, even royal family members go out to afternoon tea or social functions in London wearing these memes on their, okay, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, on their dresses, right? So if we compare this anti most famous anti-slavery meme with the Iceland meme, okay, uh, this is the Iceland meme from six years ago, from the original Iceland campaign that inspired my book title, right? And the, the one we, we have over there is the second Iceland campaign. But if we compare this, you know, uh, new digital media meme with the older meme, I think there's still a lot, a long way for us to learn. And, uh, about the campaign uh, strategies in the in the past, right? and uh, and uh, uh, my last example here is Fairphone. I don't know how many people in this room know Fairphone, but I use Fairphone. You know, uh, and uh, oh, it's, it's over there, right? It's a it's a Dutch uh, um, uh, smartphone uh, operation, right? I, I it's it's also uh, manufactured in China. I, I went to the factory to talk to people who, who make uh, Fairphones, right? So this is my Fairphone. And, and in, that, in that same factory, they make Apple products, okay? So, my, so the, the, the worker who make these phones, okay, designed to be fixed, okay, for durable use, and they, they, they told me the work is less demanding and the pay is better when they make this Fairphone compared to Apple product, or even though the profit margin for this phone is much thinner compared to okay uh, iPhones, right? So it's really about the company how they how they whether they have worker in their mind when they design their industrial uh, process, and so people can learn more about uh, alternative okay uh, development uh, you know in, in, from Amsterdam as well. So to conclude. This is the main message I hope to send today, which is about historical continuity, despite the radical specificity of African or Afro-American versus Chinese or Asian labor. Yes, there are oceans apart and centuries away from each other. Yes, there, there, there was a shift of gender from male to female as the most quintessential of the enslaved labor, but they are both in shackles oppressed and exploited, weighed down by the capitalist world system and the colonial masters, old and new. It is this subjugation, alienation, and violent suppression that constitute their strongest bonds across racial categories, across national boundaries, across history. At this point, it should be amply clear that digital media remains in the shadow of slavery passed from Apple, Foxconn, and the Congo to the new world of digital and social media. It is therefore imperative to see through digital capitalism, to understand the worsening of labor conditions along the assembly line and inside the data mine as anything but coincidental.
It is therefore imperative to make the case that the abolition of ice slavery is not only possible, rather it is an urgent duty we have no choice but to take on. To do so, we have to reimagine a better alternative digital economy based on more holistic understanding of digital labor. We need more interdisciplinary dialogue and interactions with activists and practitioners. We need to learn from the enslaved, both in the past and at present, from a new praxis of anti-slavery, informed by history, a holistic global history of human struggle as a whole against capitalism and colonialism for an ultimate emancipation that shall abolish all form of 21st century slavery that set humanity free. Chinese workers and activists have much more to learn from the transatlantic theater of African resistance and the lessons of transatlantic abolition. Many of those lessons also came from London. Okay? And the most important lesson being that slavery has been and will be defeated. So last and most important, remember to, to buy the book. Okay? <laughs> Your money will go to, okay, this is the name of the Congolese NGO, it's called OGP, of the Governance and Peace Observatory. Okay? And they're doing excellent work on the ground. And uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, paperback here will be 20 pounds. Okay? If you buy uh, from Kindle, it's 10 pounds. Right? And your money will end up helping African uh, workers. Thank you. And, uh, actually, uh, we can we can offer you a book at uh, fifteen pounds. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Okay, <laughs> discounts. All right. Yeah. And then okay. you want to make a donation of some of that towards breaking the frontier. Indeed. You're very